uh, the head of an art school, a very important art school, and an advisor to Prince Albert. Prince Albert was Queen uh, Victoria's husband, consort, uh, greatly beloved by the Queen, very interested in design, and in a position to help make things happen. What happened was it was thought that it might be a nice idea to have a great uh, to have an exhibition in London. Partly because England had embraced, and I'm giving you background which makes you understand why things change. Remember, France was the leader in design. France had the best design, France had the best craftsmen, the most beautiful objects. France did not embrace the Industrial Revolution. The French still liked things handcrafted. I mean, the French, all the way back to when we're going to talk about this term, um, all the way up to Art Deco in the 1920s, the French still wanted to have things made by hand of exotic materials, which turned out to be luxury items that only the elite could afford. It wasn't that they were only elitist. It was that they loved handcrafted luxury goods. The English were very quick, were the first to embrace the Industrial Revolution and the idea of making things in a modern way in factories. So this was a chance for them to show the fruits of their industrial labors. And what was, what, uh, <coughs> what was the place in which to show this was called the Crystal Palace, designed by Joseph Paxton. Someone want to make a guess? What does this look like? What does this remind you of? It's, huh? It's, it's like an acolyte. I can't hear you. Like in a colors? No, um, the structure itself. Wait a what have you seen in the modern world that this looks like? Fan. Hmm? Fan. Or a okay. barrel? Was it a barrel? Board? Oh no, I'm not, not even talking about the shape. Glass and steel. Anybody see a greenhouse? Uh -huh. The botanical gardens. Paxton had built a botanical garden. And people thought, what kind of thing is, um, do you know Alice in Wonderland's, right? Lewis Carroll called this a great cucumber, a, a, a cucumber holder. And, um, you know, I wrote down. Yeah, it was, okay, I wanted to, a cucumber frame. This was 30 meters high. It was 900,000 square feet of sheet glass. That's what I always bring in notes. It was a 24-foot span of prefab modules that were assembled on site. This was the first time anybody used iron for aesthetic purposes. Iron at that point was used for railroads and building bridges and basic construction. Um, so as I said, some people hated it like the cucumber frame. Other people thought it was wonderful. Tens of thousands of people came from all over, well, 32,000 visitors per day, six million people all together. And this is not for you to remember. I write it down, I don't remember it, but I want to impress you with how much of a big deal event it was. There were books written about my visit to the Great Exhibition. People came from all over London, all over the world, but particularly, I mean, not all over London, all over England. Uh, it was very large. There were full-size trees in it. Has anybody been down to, do you know the Winter Garden at the World Financial Center? That, okay, that's like a great, green. oh, that's a great space. They're, they're redoing it now. I'm not sure what they're putting in. But that's this kind of space with a large, and the Winter Garden is, I think, steel frame. So this was the kind of structure which hadn't existed before. We, in fact, built one in America a couple of years later on the site that is now Bryant Park. And it was taken down. This one from England, everybody liked it so much that they took it down and put it up in the north of England and used it as an exhibition hall for a few years, and it burned down. Obviously, the iron is, well, what happens is iron, if it's hot enough, can melt. So there is no more Crystal Palace, as there is not one in New York. But this was a site like this. There were about 100,000 objects on exhibition. You can see this 
found, this is about 30 feet high, this was all of Waterford crystal. And it was thereafter in a, at least one museum exhibition I know of. I mean, way before my time, I don't know if this still exists. But there were things like this built for this exhibition, which you see is on two levels. And as I said, 100,000 exhibits. This is every manufacturer's, designer's, international uh, representatives trying to show the best of what they had and showing manufactured objects. And this is Victoria and Albert opening the exhibition. And one of the reasons it was important that Albert was a supporter of this is that he could, he could get government money allocated for the project. You know, you paid to have your own exhibit, but the government is who paid Joseph Paxton to build it. And these are the kind of way the exhibits were set up. You will see indications of the Gothic style here, a great many of those. And all of these objects, which you know people could look at and then go someplace to order. And this is part of the machinery hall. This is, I'm sorry, this one's the machinery hall. So it was showing not just the objects of industrialization, but it was lionizing, idealizing industrialization itself. But there were things like this when we're talking about what kind of objects were admired. Well, this is an incident of if you can put one of these ornaments on, why not put 200 of them on? And pieces like this. This is what gave Victorian design a bad name, is whatever you could do, do more of it. And this is the most admired piece in the exhibition. Ford & Wise, the name of the manufacturer, this sideboard was done <coughs> as an exhibition piece. One of the things you would do for a show like this when they were doing World's Fairs is a manufacturer would do an exhibition piece, which would have been too large and too elaborate to exist anywhere in anyone's home. It was basically to show what they could do. So you could go there, you wouldn't order this piece, but you would say, oh gee, I love their carving, I want something with this kind of carving. It showed off all their craftsmanship. And it, and it won the main award. This is the size of the piece. Look at the size of the piece compared to the people looking at it. So nowadays we would consider it a monstrosity. If we saw it in a museum, we would be properly impressed by the workmanship. And these people were encouraged to, you know, hire Ford and Watt to make them an object. But another thing here, if I said what style is it, I don't know, it's a whole mishmash of a whole bunch of different things. Um, so what happened at the end of the fair, Henry Cole and other people like him, but Henry Cole is an important critic uh, who published a book about design and style, people like him said, uh, we have to do something about taste. Our level of taste in England is not very good. Uh, the book he published at the school was called The Journal of Manufacturers, which was talking about what was good and what was less good and complaining that there was no taste. One of the devices, and I'm not talking about it now, one of the devices for teaching people good taste was to write books about it, which would guide them. And the other was to set up a museum which would show them good objects and teach them.